Everybody knows I will not stand right here. I will move around a little bit. Uh, it's difficult for me to just be in one spot. But if you have your Bibles, open them to Revelations chapter 13. Revelations 13, verse 18. We're going to start with something. I don't know how many of you are on Facebook. What? Oh, you're not on Facebook. But if you're on Facebook, there's a lot of things about Facebook that you really need to understand. It's, it, you know, sometimes it gives you some interesting uh, illustrations. Um, usually I don't come to the pulpit with a beast. But today I have. If you've noticed on Facebook, this is circulated as the mark of the beast. Uh, and I've had people make comments on it, and they'd say, you know, it's not really the mark of the beast. It's just Hebrew letters. It's the sixth letter of the Hebrew language. But what people don't understand is the Hebrews and the Greeks did not use numbers. They used the alphabet. And so since they used the alphabet, these little marks right here represent six, six, six. And it says monster right here on front, but if you turn it to the very back, it says unleash the beast. Is this drink evil? Well, if it is, I drunk it yesterday. <laughs> My wife even sipped a little bit of it, and she said, I don't like the beast. Jazzy didn't like the beast, but I drank it all right. It didn't bother me too much. I didn't, I've still got some of it left. I didn't want them to pour it out because this can represents the beast. You've got to save as much of it as you can, right? Not necessarily. You might say, well, isn't this evil? It is a can made of aluminum. But the marketing behind it is evil. And you've got to understand we're living in a world right now that is conditioning you to accept anything of the devil. Conditioning you to understand that compromise is okay. Matter of fact, when you get to the book of Revelations, you will find out that there are seven letters to seven churches, and each one of these letters represents something that they are doing. Now, two of those churches we're actually doing things right and correct. And one church, which is very scary, it is the church of Ephesus. They were, Brian, listen to this, doctrinally pure. They were doctrinally pure. They were doing everything absolutely correct except for one thing. And the Bible says they had left their first love. And if they had left their first love, that means they were doctrinally pure, but their love had diminished. And if their love had diminished, it's the very love that distinguishes a Christian from the world. And so if you're not loving and you're not being what you should be, then that's a mark of worldliness in your life. And you need to make sure that that does not have root in your life and it's not really taking over and controlling your life. So I'm not preaching on the churches. I'm really not. But it's something this church needs to be aware of. Uh, because Brian... You know, if I was going to say anything about Brian and his preaching, how dare you preach Romans 9? What is wrong with you? <laughs> I mean, Greek professors and seminary professors, they a lot of times will teach through the book of Romans, and they will go the first eight chapters okay and skip Romans 9. Your pastor did not do that. What is wrong with you? Now, seriously, you would think if he really had concerns about how you felt, now he does, I know him, he would have skipped Romans 9, but his allegiance is not to you. He's made it perfectly clear, my allegiance is not to you, my allegiance is to God and the preaching and proclaiming of his word, and my main goal is to please him, and if I please him in the preaching thereof, if the doctrine is pure, then you should not be offended. Now, folks, I'm going to let you know something, that if you get offended at the word of God, your worship with God is wrong, your walk with God is wrong, your work with God is wrong, and you are wrong. You might say, how do you have the audacity? 
audacity to say something like that by the authority of the Word of God, that gives me the authority to proclaim the Word of God. Matter of fact, Jesus, when he preached, the scribes and Pharisees were uh, appalled at the authority of God and the way that, now I say authority of God because Jesus was God and he preached with authority. And today we are lacking in our pulpits in America because we are not preaching with authority. We're not preaching with gusto. We're not preaching with, with life. We're just making sure everybody feels okay. We are. And if we're not making everyone feel okay, I'm going to get mad at the preacher. I'm going to walk off, stomp off, and bring anybody and everybody I can bring with me. Now, folks, you may not be saved, and more than likely you are not saved if that is what you are doing or if that is what you have done and you might have repentance coming on your life right now and folks repentance doesn't mean you walk down the aisle and say God I'm sorry and then turn around and do it again repentance means you have turned it from your wicked ways and now then that crooked stick is made straight and now then you can do something for God because your worship is right your walk is right and your work will be right now folks this is not my message this is just an introduction but listen to what it says in Revelation 13, 18. And this is not my message. But listen to what it says. It says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Six, six, six. Can's not wrong. Marketing is. Somebody marketed that can knowing Revelation. Knowing the satanic practices Maybe they're satanic worshipers. Maybe they've given themselves to hate Christians, and now then they want to market something that everybody's going to drink. And it's the little things that will get you. If you go to the book of Revelation, you'll find out that uh, some of the churches hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Some of them tolerated the prophetess Jezebel. They all tolerated all that, and Brian's not going to let that happen here. Scott's not going to let that happen here. Roy's not going to let that happen here. You're going to watch what is Christian. And you're going to endorse that. But I promise you, and I'm going to get to this later, the majority will lead you astray. And be careful of that. Moses led the majority, but the majority was wrong. You've got to be able to stand, listen to this, by yourself and serve God. And I'll get to that in a minute. But the Bible says, here is wisdom. Let him, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Listen to the word count. You might want to underline that in your Bible, to count. Now, folks, we're living in an age in America where the world does not want you to believe anything. Now, I got into an argument in Hollis Faith Baptist Church with a young man on the very back row while I was preaching. How old was that young man? Maybe five, four, or five, six, maybe at the oldest now, y'all laughed. We were having an argument. I left the podium and walked down the aisle and was one pew in front of him. And we were arguing, and he was arguing back at me. Folks, I'm a preacher of God. He was just a little kid and had the audacity to tell me I was wrong. I made the comment from the pulpit that one plus one is three. He said, no, it's not. He said, it's two. I left the pulpit, went to the back row, and argued with him and never could convince him that one plus one is three. You know why? He knew he was right. And now then we're living in a world where if Brian comes up to Romans 9 and he starts preaching it, somebody's going to say, that's your interpretation. That's just what you think it says. Let me tell you something. The God I know wouldn't say something like that. The God I know would not make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. The God I know would not do that. The God I know loves absolutely everybody. I'm sorry you have the God of this world. I'm sorry you're in idolatry. I am sorry you're serving the God that is not of this Bible. I am sorry you're confused because just as that little boy said, one plus one is two, I can stand on the authority of the Word of God and say this is the attribute of God and not back up and not compromise because that's what the Word of God says. 
now then we're as Christians, the world expects us just to pussyfoot around, to sidestep the issue, to say, oh, well, you know, that's your opinion. No. As with a much authority as one plus one is two, and you can be right, you can take the Word of God, leave it in its context, and read it, and if it says something to you and your flesh don't like it, get over it. Submit yourself and bow to the leadership of the Lord. And you hear the slogan all the time, well, you need to make Jesus Lord. I promise you I've never made Jesus Lord in my life. Never. I can't make him anything. He already was. He's been Lord forever. Before the foundation of the world, he was Lord. I can't make him something he already is. But I can bow and say, Master, Owner, possessor I'm not my own I'm bought with a price I belong to you yes I call you Lord yes I bow before your holiness yes but if I don't bow before him in everything he is not Lord for me he's always Lord I can't dethrone him I can't make him anything but what he is and he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings and God is exactly who he says he is but the Bible says here we need to count the number of the beast. Don't let this world confuse you. Don't let this world make you compromise the issues of Christianity. Because you've got to stand. And if you're not standing, you'll fall for anything. And churches, I promise you that if this church continues to stand, that demons of hell will come into this church and they will be subtle. Let me tell you something. The devil will try any way in this world to get me to compromise. I can count his number 666. And I can understand the devices of the devil. But let me tell you the things that the devil does not try to do for me. Now, you might say, well, what is it? Well, I'll tell you one thing. The devil can put a beautiful woman in front of me. I mean gorgeous. I mean that when she walks down the, the sidewalk, every man is looking. Every man might desire to have her. I'm married. That's no temptation to me. I have resolved already when I made my wedding vows to be faithful to my wife. And I'm promising you, young ladies, I only have one in here. Well, I got Jazzy back here with one right there. I promise you the, the boys of this world will promise you absolutely everything and won't mean a word they're saying. I promise you. Let me tell you something about boys. He's sitting right beside you. <laughs> boys, boys, now we got a bunch of us from, from right on up here, right on down there. Boys are pigs, no matter how snoutless they may appear. Do I get an amen from that? They'll tell you anything. They will. Boys are manipulators. But the devil will not use a woman to try to get to me. I've made sure I stay in check with my wife all the time. See, I've got biblical example to how, how to stay pure. David failed, and David was a man after God's own heart. David wanted to serve God, but he was not doing what he should have been doing at the time. The Bible says that when kings were out to war, he was up on the rooftop checking out his neighbor. So the devil might try to do that. He might get me into a store, and he might say, well, look at that. You don't have the money to buy that. Won't you just steal it? The devil won't do that kind of stuff for me because he knows he cannot win a battle there. And he's going to do the same thing with you. He is going to attack you where you are the weakest. And he knows where that's at. See, the devil's been around since Adam and Eve. He has studied mankind intensively all that time. See, the word demon literally translated out literally means intelligent being. They're not dummies. They know exactly where your weakness is, whether it's getting along with everybody. Let me tell you something. The church of Ephesus, which this church is much like, doctrinally pure, willing to serve and, and, and serve God, but they messed up on their first love. There should never, ever be in this church anyone who walks through that door that you don't just 
hover over and love them. You should do that with each other. And if you don't do that with each other, there is sin in your life. And if you repetitively don't do that with each other, I promise you, you may not make it to heaven. More than likely, you probably will not because the Bible says, ye shall know them by their fruits. You might say, well, you can't judge like that. The Bible says I can. The Bible says that he that is spiritual judgeth all things, but the world will tell you, oh, you're not supposed to judge. I'm sorry, one plus one is two. The boy was right. And the Bible says you shall know them by their fruit. Just like I said, boys or pigs, no matter how snoutless they may appear, that's our fruit. We're just piggish in ways. If you don't believe that, just clean up after us. <laughs> My wife was telling me on the way here that the trash can can be two or three feet away and the cabinet would be right there. So? <laughs> What's the point? I'm a pig. Try not to be. I try to do things around the house. But the basic nature of females is, you know, they're emotional. They like to carry on about things. Sometimes you just can get too much estrogen in one building. <laughs> Women, am I telling the truth? And guys, I, I tell you, this females, I'm talking about men and women, females, uh, they can hold a grudge forever. You can have an art and conversation about this can. And, and the women that go home, Pastor James said that can is evil. And, they, and, and you might say, well, no, I'm going to continue to drink this. I like it. And, and, and they might continue to use that. And you might argue about this can for a few minutes. But in less than a few minutes, three years back will come up. You remember three years back when you did this? Man, am I right? Do I get an Amen. It's not about the monster drink anymore. It's not about the can. It's about whatever it takes to win this argument. Men are pigs. Women can be emotional. We all know that. But the point is, the devil knows each one of you. The devil knows how to get your goat. And you know why he knows how to get your goat? Because you let him know where your goat's tied all the time all the time we get up ranting and raving about something if this happens today at work I am going to blow my top you know what's going to happen the devil is going to see to it that that absolutely happens and you're going to blow your top as programmed because you programmed yourself early that morning already so the Bible says count the number of the beast for it is the number of man and his number is six hundred three score and six and I hadn't got to my message yet six is the number of man six hundred is the number of warfare now what importance does that bring us it brings us to our text but before we get to my text I, it scares me when I come to the pulpit with so many scriptures uh, does anybody have some fish and some loaves and a bag we may need them uh but listen to what it says in 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, going all the way back to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel, I'm going to rehearse to you who David is. David is a nobody. Matter of fact, his father didn't think that much about him. Samuel appears on the scene. Now, I, I, for the sake of brevity, I am going to let you read a lot of this yourself. But mark these scriptures down. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and you're going to find that what I tell you, for the sake of brevity, is there. But I'm going to tell you, Samuel... Uh, gets a message from God and God tells him I want you to go see the sons of Jesse and he appears on the scene in the city all, all of a sudden really gets upset because Samuel the prophet is showing up they don't know if he's mad upset or, or what's going on and they literally ask him uh, is there any need to fear you and Samuel says no now folks can you imagine when a pastor goes into a town people are, are afraid why shouldn't they be 
He represents a holy God. Scott gets up and preaches. He represents a holy God. We have left out the holy part of God in this world, and we think that right now we don't have to change anything in our lives, that we can live just the way we are, and God is pleased and happy with us. Let me tell you something. There are so many broken people and broken-hearted people out there that we walk by them with no concern, with no apathy, no empathy whatsoever. We let them be as they are. This is a grace church. This is a sovereign grace church. You should excel in evangelism more than any other church in this town. You might say, well, the church down the road, they believe in free will and they're out and they're busy. Well, let me tell you something. You believe in the sovereignty of God. You believe in the election of God. You believe that God has promised you that the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. You know that God has planted the harvest, that God has been the husbandman, the, the manager of the crop, and he's taking care of it, and it is ready to be harvested. You know that you had nothing to do with that, and God says, I need laborers, and because we believe in the sovereign grace of God, and we know that there is the election of God, we need to make sure that there is not a church in this town that witnesses more than we do because we believe in the doctrine of election because we believe that if God has a will he is going to perform it if you don't witness and if you don't evangelize and you're not a soul winner and you don't have empathy and compassion for those around you you may not be saved you might say preacher you're really making that road pretty narrow well that's what God says it is narrow there's people all around us hurting, brokenhearted, coming out of uh, divorced homes, coming out of homes where they've, they've lost family members. Let me tell you what happened in Carlin, Nevada. Carlin, Nevada, we had a 17-year-old girl that was coming to our church. Her name was Monica. We wanted to adopt her. 17 years old. Why would we want to adopt someone as old as 17? 17 months, okay. Two years, okay. Five years, okay. Six or seven years, okay. But add 10 years to that, 17 years old. Why would you adopt a 17-year-old kid? We loved her. She loved us. She had nowhere to go on Christmas. Had no family reunions to get acquainted with. Had no family members to get acquainted with. And could write beautiful. Oh, she'd write letters. And, and, and when I say letters, her letters, even her letters of the letter was beautiful. She wanted to be adopted. We wanted to adopt her. Her problem was she listened to everybody around her and lost it. To this day, I would be the father of a daughter. I've never been the father of a daughter. I would love to be a father to a daughter. I've got a granddaughter, spoil her rotten. Can't imagine what it would be like to be a father of a daughter. But she listened to the world all around her and said, Monica, you're 17. You're going to turn 18. You're going to be on your own. You don't need a family. You know who she was listening to? People who had a family. People who were not in her situation. Who were not going through her problems of life. They couldn't relate. Now I'm saying all that to lead up to a point. You are who you are. And people around you will steal your blessing from you. What happened to Monica? I have no idea. Last I heard of Monica, she had went downhill, living in sin, working at a casino, being in the world. What could have changed everything in her life? When we left Nevada, she had went with us to Montana. When we left Montana, she had came with us to Oklahoma. Would her life have been different? Yes. Because we would have made a difference in her life. Are you making a difference in anybody's life? 
Samuel appears on the scene and he's willing to make a change in someone's life and he goes to Jesse's house and he says I am going to anoint somebody and I don't know who they are but I do know that from God he said that it's going to be one of your boys now I want to see all of them and they bring all the boys before him and he looks at them and well one's tall one's big matter of fact one is a soldier and he is uh, in the military and he's one of uh, Saul's men we'll find that out in the next chapter that scares you doesn't it next chapter uh, we're going to find that out Saul looks at him strong muscles works out can wield a sword good can make a great king nah he's not the one he is not the one and then after he looks at all of them God had promised him already that one of the boys of Jesse's was going to be king. All he had to do was anoint him. So he looks at Jesse and he says, is this all your boys? Because God hadn't spoken to him yet. God hadn't looked at and said, this is the one yet. And he says, well, I got my baby boy. He's out in the field. And you hear the way I said that, my baby boy. He's my youngest son. He's out in the field. He's just tending to the sheep fetch him. The Bible says Samuel won't even sit down until he gets there. He said, we're going to stand for this occasion. And I'm sure he paced around a little bit, waited around a little bit, wondering how long it's going to take the boy to leave the sheep. Now I'm sure that he was concerned because he was a shepherd boy and he wanted to make sure the sheep was okay and I don't know if he, he dilly-dallied around any or not, but I'm sure if Samuel the prophet wanted to see him, he didn't waste much time. And he appears on the scene, and Samuel hears from God. And God says, this is the boy, anoint him. Now, folks, listen to what happens. Verse 12 says, and he sent and brought him in. Now, he was ready. I don't know if any of you know what ready is, but in the Hebrew language, that means he was read. I don't know if he was kind of uh, red face from the running or a uh, red freckled face. I don't understand that. I do know the Bible says he was red. I don't know if he's red headed. I don't know. The Bible just said he was ready. That means red. And with all, now girls, you'll like this part. He was beautiful. He was beautiful. Handsome. A hunk. That's what you girls call them now, right? Hunks. He was a hunk. Oh, son, he is a hunk. Because the Bible says he was good looking. Listen to what it says. And it says, and with all of beautiful countenance. I'm telling you, if you would have seen David, you would have dumped him. <laughs> he was handsome. Boy, I'm just glad he wasn't around when my wife was looking for somebody. She wouldn't even have looked at me, but he was handsome. Now, Samuel anointed him. Folks, there's a lot to that. That's something you don't take lightly. There is a lot of assurance in being anointed. That means God is not making a mistake here. God knows exactly what he's doing all the time. Now, folks, I want you to think about that. We believe that God is omniscient, all-knowing. Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurs to God? Nothing. He knows what's down the road for you next week. He knows what you're going to be doing five years from now. He even knows who you're going to marry, how many kids you're going to have, what their names are. You might say, well, how does he know that? Maybe he elected them before they were ever even thought of by you. See, the Bible even says he knows genealogy before genealogy ever happens. You might say, well, how's that possible before genealogy ever happens? Adam and Eve, before they ever knew each other, he knew what was going to happen. The Bible even says in Peter that he prepared a lamb for their sin before the world was. A lamb prepared before the foundation of the world. A lamb was for sin. Well, get this part right. He was anointed. Verse 14 says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Uh, the verse above that says, and I missed verse 13, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Boy, I tell you, that happens to us at salvation. Now, you think of the anointing of God 
You think of David being anointed. You were anointed in salvation. The Bible even says you were sealed by the king. You were sealed by the spirit of God. And God has made you his child. He has worked adoption in you. Now then you are a child of royalty. And you need to act like one. You need to be what God wants you to be. Now, you need to understand this thoroughly because you are just like David. You have been anointed. You are saved. You need to act like you were anointed and be anointed and act anointed because that's exactly what David did. The Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and whew, he was anointed. You got a fast clock. Uh, <clears throat> and the Bible says that God sent Saul an evil spirit. Underline that. You might want to underline that to go with Romans 9 where it says he makes one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. You, you just might want to underline that. Just, just say it. There's a lot of things in Scripture you have to come into agreement with. The Bible says two kings walk together unless they be agreed. See, you can't walk with God if you disagree with him. The Bible says my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. It also says no other voice will they follow. It scares me when people get upset and distraught because of the word of God and get mad at the messenger of it and leave and stomp away and take their venomous attitude with them and then proclaim to be a Christian. Wow. Seriously? That is not the word of God. The Bible says, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. No other voice will they follow better check salvation you shall know them by their fruit well I tell you when you've got oil dripping all over you how many of you watched uh, these cold water bucket challenges on Facebook everybody gets that cold water trust me they know when the cold water hits them David knew when that oil was dripping off of his head that he had been anointed by Samuel his worship really got right with God. Now you listen to this real close. I'm going as fast as I can. His worship got right with God because then he knew his relationship with God was real and true. His worship was right. Now folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scare you on this one, but his walk was right as well. Let me go on down uh, and, and I'll scare you here in just a minute. Uh, but then this evil spirit comes and he's just really a messenger sent uh, by God to do these evil things for his glory and praise. Uh, see, the, see, God can use demons any way he wants to. You know why he can do that? He's God. Trust me, they look for an opportunity to serve him. Matter of fact, there was a place in the Bible where uh, God was looking for a lying spirit, and a lying spirit appeared before him and said, send me. And that lying spirit entered into three or 400 prophets. I don't know. One spirit went into that many. You might say, wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. Well, anyway, let me go on. Saul is looking for somebody to comfort him and verse 18 says and then they answered one uh, of his servants and said behold I have seen a son of Jesse the Beth Bethlehemite that is cunning and playing and mighty valiant man and a man of war prudent in matters and a comely person and the Lord is with him folks his worship was right so his walk was right folks you got to get this his worship was right and his walk was right. If your worship is right, your walk will always be right. And if you are walking because of your worship, you will also be working because of your walking and because of your worship. You might say, well, I don't like working. I get distraught. I get upset. Get my knickers tied in a knot when I have to do something. Because... You don't want to be a part of the work. You want to be just there. I was listening to Robert Jeffress on the way here, and, and, and he was talking about people who were pretending to be Christians, and they really weren't. And he says and they have a, a, a slogan in, in Texas where you're, you're trying to be something that you're not, and, and that little slogan goes this way. He says, they're all hat and no cattle. You, you get that expression? When I used to ride bulls and was in the rodeo uh, area and I, I rode bulls and, and I was a bullfighter all at, all at the same time I made more money bullfighting than I did riding because I didn't stay on long enough I don't know why they have eight seconds when it should be three or two seconds you'd have more competition that way 
So in that area, we used to laugh at what we'd call drugstore cowboys. They'd put on hat. They dressed like a cowboy. They'd have their boots on. But they didn't look real to us because we were real and knew what real was. And see, if you want to be a real Christian, your worship has to be right. Your walk has to be right. And if you're in those two categories, you'll have work. Now listen to me. He was anointed by Samuel the prophet. He worshiped. His testimony of his walk was right. Now then he has to work. Now what kind of work is he going to do? He's going to fight a giant. And the Bible says in the New Testament, all of this in the Old Testament is for our example. I've heard so many stories about David and Goliath. This young boy goes and slays the giant. Unbelievable. Let me tell you, that's not all of it. I hope to, to teach you some things today that maybe you haven't heard already. But I'm going to get back to the worship part of it. I want to warn you right now. There is, it is great to have a time uh, with your wife and, and with your family to have that family altar and all that but you better not stop there now I, uh, my wife will tell you real quick I'm not very good in this area I have a personal worship time for myself my wife has all the time uh, the desire for us to be together and she's right we need to have our time together uh, uh, of really studying the word of God but let me tell you there is a warning involved with that I don't know how many of you have ever smoked cigarettes, but if you look on it, Surgeon General says over here that it could be hazardous to your health. It's written right there, but people do it anyway. I'm telling you right now, here is a message, a warning with this message. This could be hazardous to your health. If you are having a family worship time experience by your family only, you are in trouble. Because your wife is going to depend on your spiritual leadership. And when it comes time for her to stand alone, she will not be able to. Or maybe husbands are depending upon the wife and their spiritual knowledge. And now then it's time for them to stand alone. And they're not able to stand. And then you've got this child who's been part of the family worship experience. And they've listened to mom and daddy. And, and, and they've gathered their strength from them. And, and now then they're living off of their power and their strength. One of these days that child is going to have to stand on her own. And they won't know how. Lead them into a personal relationship with God. Lead them to the place where they have to worship themselves. Lead them to a place where they have to get before a holy God by themselves. Because if not, one day the devil's going to say, Ah, he's not around. Ah, she's not around. Ah, mom and dad's not around. Now it's time to tempt. And they have to stand on their own. Have to stand on their own. And they can't do it. Because they never learn to worship by themselves. The Bible says be still and know God. That's an individual statement. Be still and know God. By all means, continue with your family worship. Continue with the family altar. Continue your, your family praying. Do all of that. But in the process, teach them to stand by themselves because when peer pressure hits, they have to stand by themselves. Now, David's worship was right. His walk was right. Now then he's got to get his work right. And we find this happening in Samuel, verse 18, chapter 18. I'm just now getting to my message. Sorry. Chapter 18. No, I'll lie to you. Chapter 17. I'll get it right here in a minute. Chapter 17. We're going to deal with... Uh, I don't even know why I bring notes to the podium. I never use them. <clears throat> but in chapter 17, I'm not going to read this to you. I'm going to let you take it home and read it for yourself. But I'm going to point out some things for you. Count the number. Verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. Six cubits and span and he had a helmet of brass upon his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat 
was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And his staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear had a weight of 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. You find out that his height was six cubits in the span. You find out that there's six body armors. You find out that his spearhead was 600. Let me read that. 600 shekels of iron. 600 meaning warfare. Six pieces of body armor. Height, six cubits in a span. That's three feet taller than Michael Jordan. His body armor alone, just his coat of mail, weighed 200 pounds. That's a hunk of a man, isn't it? Ten feet tall, give or take a few inches. And he struck fear in the nation of Israel. How do I know that? The Bible tells me so. Verse 11 says, And when Saul and all the Israel heard these words from the Philistine and the words that he heard was Goliath cursing Israel, telling them what a sorry old God they had, and they were listening to that. And it says here that Saul and all of Israel heard those words of the Philistine, and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Dismayed. It means they were shattered, broken, and scared. That's what it means. This is an army. Right before that, you'll find out that they had already the demons of hell and the enemy will dictate to you the rules of warfare. Matter of fact, this Goliath uh, appears before the scene and you've got to understand this valley is here and this uh, branch runs right through it. And in the bottom of this branch is a bunch of uh, round rocks. Uh, geological marvel because all the rocks in this bed of this branch or this brook is all round. When David picks up five stones, he doesn't have to look around. Just picks up five good, nice, heavy ones, puts them in his bag, and he's ready to go. He didn't have to search for five round rocks. Uh, the geological marvel of this brook is that all of the rocks are round and smooth. So when he got ready to pick one up, he didn't have to worry about which ones he was picking up. But God had sent him to pick up five. and We'll find out out here in a minute. But it says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, folks, this is the army of God, the church of God, uh, willing to do something and doing nothing. How we are dismayed and afraid when somebody comes to our church and they start causing a little trouble. And we sit back. The Bible says Israel was arrayed for the battle. It means they looked like soldiers. You go and play war, don't you? Matter of fact, he's been to war. You've been to war, haven't you? He not only puts on the suit, he's been to war. He knows what it's like to fight. But there's a lot of people who put on the uniform. And they dress up. I think they join the Air Force, don't they? <laughs> just, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> just, just kidding. No, no, they, they dress up. They, they are soldiers. Every, one, every branch of our military are soldiers. I only say that because of Air Force people here. <laughs> I got to compose myself here. <laughs> Navy, huh? All right, I, I like that. Well, anyway, it is expected of a soldier to fight. And sometimes we get people in our churches that uh, we get a problem maker in our church and instead of doing something about it, we're dressed in our array and we're walking around saying, what are we going to do? Uh, maybe they'll just get mad, upset, and leave one of these days. Uh, let me tell you, if that happens, if you let them talk, uh, if you tolerate them and, and you let them stay and you let them cause trouble, when they do leave, they're going to take somebody with them. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. That's what the Bible says, and that's going to happen. You have to stand now. When the battle confronts you, you must run toward it. How could David, with all of his audacity, do this? He walks up there, and he hears this Goliath defying the armies of God, and he looks around at all these soldiers hunkering down, wondering what they're going to do. Matter of fact, when Goliath gets ready to move, everybody moves out of his way. They don't want to even get close to him. 
because he has a sword he can fight up close. He has a javelin he can throw and hit you with it. He's ready for battle afar and battle up close. He is prepared for battle. And so they scurry around him afraid that they're going to get within reach of him. They're not soldiers. They're dressed like soldiers. They're all had no cattle. They're not ready to fight. Every day for 40 days, 40 days they gather at this brook and, and they're on one side and the armies of God are on the other side. And they wonder what in the world are they going to do. Let me tell you something. There's always a line drawn in the sand. And at this particular time, there's a brook marking the line. The enemies of God is on one side and the army of God is on the other side. And one side represents death and the devil. It represents fear and failure. It represents a family of the devil. And folks, you get this right. There's only two families in this world. Only two. Not three. People will tell you there's three. There's not. There's only two. The Bible says in John chapter 8, you can read it for yourself, there's only two families in God's. There is the family of the devil and the family of God. And you will find out which one you're in by the fruit that you bear. People say, well, where's the third one at? third one's us. We think we are our own vessels. We think that we control our destiny. We think it's up to us. The Bible says, no. If you were of your family, the devil, you're going to do the deeds of your father. That's John 8. But if you were of my father, Jesus speaking, you would do the deeds of my father. One or the other. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. I've got to hurry. I'm, I'm skipping a lot of notes. I'm sorry. First thing you need to do when you find out that you've got a Goliath in your life and each one of you are going to have one, it might be a broken heart. It might be. It might be troubles you don't know what to do. It might be relationship problems. You, you might be going home and, and fussing with your family every, every day. I don't know what it is in your life. I don't know what the problems are. But I promise you, if you're serving God, I promise you that warfare is at your doorstep, if not in your house, that the number 600 is present and war has started. And I promise you that that number 6 that represents man is going to get in your way. And you might wear that number 6. You might be getting in your own way. Because you've not surrendered the battle over to the Lord. You might say, how can David be so pompous and proud? Let me tell you something, he wasn't. He was anointed. There's a difference. See, his brother, after he appears on the scene, let me skip through a bunch of it. His brother even tells him, why are you here? See, Jesse sent him well, with some, something vittles to eat. We'll put it that way. He says, go take this to your brothers and, and give them some food uh, for your captain of thousands. Give him something to eat as well. They've been doing this for 40 days. David takes his food to him, and he hears Goliath ranting and raving about the things of God. And here, he looks at a defeated army all around him. He says, what is going on here? I'll fight this giant. This is a boy wanting to do a man's job. Men all around him, but a boy wanting to do a man's job. See, he understood that on his side, he had to be fearless and faithful. If you're going to stand for God, you have to be fearless and faithful. You have to have purpose and power because you're the family of God. Well, his brother saw him. Verse 28 says, And Eliab, his elders, uh, heard him. And when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? He wasn't even important enough to say a bunch of sheep, a herd of sheep. A parcel of sheep, but a few sheep. You're not even that important that my father would trust you with a bunch. Just a few. Now listen to me. Your friends will discourage you. Your family members will discourage you. And you will be doing the right thing and for the right reason and for the right purpose. And people all around you will discourage you and tell you, you need to get off of Romans 9. Hurry up. Get through it. People around you will tell you to go this 
place and that place. You're hurting people's feelings and all this. And David was listening to all of that and it did not matter to David at all. He was faithful and he was fearless because God had anointed him just like he has anointed you to stand up for the things of God and to fight for God. You might say, well, how could he be fearless? He was anointed. He had already been anointed by Samuel to be king and he knew he wasn't king yet. And so God was going to make sure that he made it through this battle unharmed because God is faithful to his word. God is faithful by his prophets. God is faithful to this book. And he says, you go. And we find out that David said, I can take this Goliath. And the men around him said, well, if you want to do it, you go ahead. You know, we'll just sit around here and watch if you want to. We don't mind seeing some little kid get killed. That's war. Casualty of war. No big deal. You might say, well, it is a big deal. Well, I promise you, you've been in enough war, and I, I have never been in war. I'm going to tell you, I've never been in war. My brother's been in war. And they tell me that war, if you've been in it enough, will start to desensitize you. You'll learn to sacrifice things you didn't think you could sacrifice. My brother told me that when he went to Vietnam, within two weeks he learned not to have a friend. Because one day he had him, and one day he didn't. You learn to get acquaintances, but not friends. Not someone that you're real close to, because you might lose them. Pretty soon you get to be desensitized. These soldiers, they didn't care if he went to battle with him, as long as they didn't have to. They were scared. They weren't fearless or faithful. They were shaking in their boots. They didn't want to have to go to battle. They had women and children at home they had to go back to. Last thing they wanted to do is go fight. And David said, I'll do it. Matter of fact, you read on here and uh, Saul hears about it and says, call the boy to me. And he gets to him and he says, you can't do this. You're just a kid. You're just a kid. He says, oh yeah, let me tell you something. When I was watching the sheep, a bear came and a lion came. And they started to attack my sheep, and I did something with them because God anointed me to do something with them. That bear doesn't exist anymore. That lion's not here. God gave me that victory. And he'll do the same thing with Goliath. He will. Now, David knew he need belittle his battle. See, sometimes we build something up to where it's so big we can't do anything. Belittle your battle. The Bible says that he called him an uncircumcised dog. He belittled it. Matter of fact, and, and I'm moving on as fast as I can, belittle your battle. Be yourself. Because Saul says, here's all my armor, put it on. Well, he couldn't put it on. It didn't fit. He had not proved it. He put on this all this armor on. It was made for Saul. It didn't fit. He said, I haven't proved it. He said, just give me my slingshot. I thought it's not, it, it's not one of those things you put your hand in, you pull back and shoot like that. It's something that you swing, you put a rock in it, you swing. That's what he went to battle with. And the Bible says that he left Saul, and Goliath starts calling him a dog, and the Bible says, now get this, he ran to his battle. America runs from their problems. Every one of us will have a Goliath in their life and we will try our best to run away from it. You're a child of the king. Run to your problem knowing that God has providence and that he is going to take care of you. You are a child of the king. And the Bible says he picked up five smooth stones. Why five? Was he afraid he was going to miss? Not at all. Goliath had three sons and one brother. That in 2 Samuel, they would die. Each stone represented a victory that Israel would have. And Goliath would lose his family. Because not only did David slay Goliath, he slew his family. Not by his own hand, but the Bible says by David and his men were they slain. Three sons, one brother, five stones. What does that mean? 
Well, in Romans chapter, I got it wrote down here, 11, I think it is, you're going to get to. In verse 5 and 6, you'll see grace mentioned five times. Works, four times. What does numbers mean? Five is always the number of grace and goodness of God. God delivered David from his present problem, and he was delivering him from his future problem. Can you do that? Can you trust God today with your personal problem now? Knowing God is going to bless you down the road, things you can't even see, and he's going to give you grace to do it with. Grace, mentioned five times, works for. Work, work, number four represents creation, represents unregenerate man. We can't do anything of ourselves. It all has to be of God. I'm going to give you one more story and I'm going to close. In Numbers 13, we know that uh, they went to spy off the land. Moses says, I need two spies. Check it all out. They did that for 40 days as well. But listen to what it says here. They had a majority report and a minority report. Minorities, nine times out of ten, are correct. Majority, nine times out of ten, is wrong. The majority said, we can't take this land. Minority said, oh, yeah, we can. But listen to the, what the majority said. We, they said, we can't do this. Because there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in theirs. Who are you? How do you see yourself? Do you see God taking care of your problems, your Goliaths today, and all of his cousins and brothers and all that in the future? He will. He'll take care of your problems today. He'll do whatever he needs to do for you now as well as tomorrow and the next day and the next day. But how do you look at yourself? Do you see yourself as a grasshopper? I'll promise you everybody else is going to see you the same way. Or do you look at yourself as anointed, a child of the king? royalty running through your veins with that you can do anything if God be for us who can be against us